Morris, come on. No, you can still hear me. Mar, uh, fine. Falco. Vir Virgil, oh, uh, you're still here. Not for long. My memories, our oh, memories, they're fading. Fast, fast, fast. Someone severed our connection. Someone severed our connection. Uh, who? Uh. An extraordinary An force. force. Uh, I couldn't I see who did, who did it, but. But. but you can still, you find, still her. find her. Find the girl. Uh, she can still bring this all together. Virgil. Now go. Listen. Listen. It's dark. Cold. So cold. So cold. So cold. So cold. So cold. So cold. This must be what you call pain. This, this must, must be, be the hurt. Need. You need to find, you need to find the girl. The girl. Find her. Find, her. find, her. find the girl. You are not alone. You are not alone. Conscious realms, dancing, blending, fusing themselves to memory until we can no longer ascertain what is real from fabrication. Celestial doors may open to reveal sights of all, but forebode a dreadful fate for our planet on the brink. From Jet Falco and DreamersEcho.com, this is Mondria Memories, the Dreamers Echo Podcast. Memory 1, Donovan Lennox, on the eve of great battle. Here. It happens here. The connection drops. What? That's it? It, it just ends? Hmm. I am unable to stabilize a strand to the boy's memory since this precise moment. And what about the dream guy? Can you still follow him? Traces remain. Something forced him out of observable range. <sighs> Someone. You see it as well? Yeah. Another conduit. A separate flow just beyond our sight. But a, another dreaming Mondrian can't exist. You know that's impossible. Impossible? Unless someone found a way to, I don't know, siphon energy from the device? Now, hold on a minute. You don't actually think someone's tampered with the boy's pocket watch. That dream seed is the one connection that cannot be severed. Severed? <laughs> what exactly do you know of this dream seed? Can its structure be weakened? Altered? Could a single atom of its inner workings be unsettled within? <sighs> the results would be... A distortion? <sighs> a circumvention? Oh, were you to say catastrophic? <laughs> Open your eyes. The Dream Seed is tainted. Poisoned. He can no longer be reached. No, no! That can't be it! The Energy is in excess here! The connection should be stronger than ever! Energy abounds. Supply is not a concern. The current guide has discovered a new element that we have not. Something malicious. Uh, I see. Well, now that you mention it, the last available records did bring up a poisoning of some sort. Could there be another factor at play here? 
Maybe some agent of ancient rule. A uh, hidden accomplice of... Aurelio. <sighs> Perhaps it is true. In our vast time here, I cannot rule out the possibility that someone may have broken the seal. Someone may have shifted or taken the book. Uh, damn it all! Surely you must have known this would happen. Please tell me you have a backup plan for when that sorry sack of hate wakes back up. This was the backup plan. Well, there is something I was not expecting. Something familiar. Well, what? What is it? An old friend. As long as the boy stays close, the effect of the poison can be slightly nullified. If I can reach through that, I can project one last message. All right. Then I know just the one. You ready for this? I am. Let us hope he is awakened. As long as the last guy's been doing his job, he should be getting it just fine. The boy's time with this dream guide was short, but he shared what he could. Uh, could have made him less cryptic. You did well with this one. Maybe your best work yet. But you do understand it is forbidden to disrupt the currents. I have tried once before. A single hand, no, a fingertip on the surface, forms a ripple. Ripples bring tides. Tides bear floods, resulting in more broken worlds. The mind cannot handle such a break in existence, let alone several. Yeah, I can't believe you tried that. And you're still here. I just... I can't put him through more failure. You are right to believe in him. We cannot fail again. As attuned as I am to this place, I am unsure if these walls or I can endure another loss. Oh, well, you've got my vote, boss, if it matters. I've seen how those memories have changed you. You've definitely rekindled some kind of fire inside. I'm starting to get a feeling that, that we won't lose this one. I am ready to transmit the projection. Is this the one? <laughs> yeah. You should see what she looks like, at least. I mean, what she might look like. Uh, to refocus on his goal. I don't know. Maybe it'll trigger something. It has before. And where did that get us? Yeah, back to square one, sure. As designed. I just can't believe you think the watch was broken. At this point... At this point, with all we've seen, with all you've seen, millions of outcomes and disasters, not once has the Dream Seed betrayed us. At this point, with all I have seen... But I know the thing. It's inner clockwork. It saved my own skin countless times. That device wouldn't allow itself to be exposed to external threats like that. You believe the device has started thinking for itself? <laughs> Wouldn't anything with a near-limitless funnel to the energy at least find a way? I don't know, chalk it up to some simple defense mechanism. I crafted the thing myself. You merely contained it. <laughs> Worry not. There may be another way. <gasps> what in the world? Astonishing. This is the strongest one yet. Look. More, more dreams. Not dreams, dear boy. Memories. As long as there are still dreams to be had, we will be graced with memories. <gasps> there, past the shore, just above that ridge, something new. A thread of black cloud draped in storm. Uh, I see it. Give me a second, I'll be right back. I, I need the practice. No need. I have it already. One of these days you're gonna have to teach me how to do that! <laughs> Why is this one so loud? Usually when the boy's memories arrive, they're a light dusting. I suspect these memories are not his. So there is another dreamer? You cannot deny this. Energies are being diverted all around us through unseen synthetic means. At last, they are revealed. No wonder the dream guides found it first. Can you, um, you know, put that in something? Hmm? Oh, right. I forgot the noise bothers your young ears. Soon enough, you'll 
year for these beautiful melodies. <laughs> Another neat trick. I cannot teach you anything you do not already know. Nothing is stopping you from absorbing the energy. <sighs> well, then why can't I use some to get the hell out of here? I'll remind you to control your tone in my domain, Mondrian. <clears throat> Sorry, ma'am. You are not the only one who desires freedom. Well, I don't blame you. You've been through this song and dance how many times now? I lost count ages ago. Uh, well, at least it's pretty out. If you saw just beyond that sky, you would want to cover it too. Yeah, and all your painted scenery makes it that much easier to spot those flaws. Every dream, every memory is not without storm. The final brush strokes are never mine. From gentle spring rains to calamitous squalor. Speaking of... Right, you, uh... You've got to decode that little mess. Well, I'll leave you to it. Keep an eye out, would you? Yeah, of course. Now to see who is capable of summoning such a storm. This... This is no memory. Aurelio. Could that really be you? No. No. Mortal minds cannot live the seal, lest my sacrifice be in vain. To think... Even one of these lines could allow your release. No, it is a cold, a razor doused and searing venom against my temple. To whom do such painful memories belong? This, this will take some work. not privy to. I held no exclusivity to its magnificence. It is not my own. It was given to me to share an opportunity to bridge a broken people to that which they desire most. That which was lost. That which was stolen. It's the one thing that can repair them. The one thing that can mend their wound. It is not power. It is not wealth. It is a lost, disparate thing. Humankind forfeit the search long before they realized it was gone. This wondrous, glorious thing. Ah, it simply vanished, did it not? Just as the taste of man's many pleasures has long faded. I am at a loss. I... You... You know what must be done. We must restore it to this disgusting place. We must return to them their true purpose. The ancient builders, lovers, fighters, dreamers that you once knew. But... How? I... I I cannot believe this. I am talking to a damn book. Am I to continue fooling myself into thinking something greater resides within? And yet, every page I see, more and more unyielding truths are revealed. Time and substance, now factors lost. Within your mind, true war is fought. <laughs> that one barely even rhymed, you old bastard. <sighs> yes, you may answer, Lieutenant. Your lordship, our Grand King expects your presence and word in ten minutes. Yes, of course. Thank you, Gerald. Please, leave me in silence. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps this short moment in time is a gift. Time to sift through what we've seen so far. But I need you to speak to me directly, book. I grow tired of these conundrums and ensuing quandaries. Do you take me for a childish fool fit for only schoolyard games and nursery rhymes? Mondrian life is not as whimsical as you once saw it, you inert, witless scribe. What? Nothing? <laughs> So be it. 
I'll do this myself. you see? Uh, I, I cannot be sure. Mm. The rogue dreamer, perhaps? The very same who seeks to erode our latest line to the boy. But these memories, they start a decade ago. A man donned in white and blue robes. Long silver hair obscures his face. The rest draped in shadow, cast out of my sight. So, so who is it? Who's sapping away the energy? It is hard to say. Memories always arrive a bit veiled, but I felt this obscured presence in prior lines. Before you arrived, it made itself known in one way or another, yet shielded from my sight. His role must be crucial to all of this, but I have never seen far enough to know why. In all the memories you've ever seen, this guy keeps showing up? The same cloud of... Agony. Could it be the same guy who triggered the last restart? Perhaps. I must continue my work defragmenting this enigma. If I can fully dichotomize dream from memory, I might uncover who he is. What else can you see? He's reminiscing at the war's close, shortly before Finalia drafts the treaty. Oh, the Zerok War. Incredible. And I have a few scars from those fights myself. The memories go back that far? He has granted us this private moment of reflection. Yeah. Take a closer look. Find out who the hell this guy is, and why he's tapped in. And why he poisoned the Dream Seed? <clears throat> ha ha. Very funny. There is something else. A fate I fear most. No. No. That book. No. No. Stop. Listen. You can't let that get the best of you now. We gotta focus. All right then. When you're ready, take your time. Don't go diving in too fast. If it were only so easy. His thoughts are sharp, sour, and- Hey. Yes? Be careful in there. Crest of night, nearly thirty days prior. The light of the full moon had begun to creep its way into the sky, anxious to replace the boisterous sun. Grand Finalian King Gregorio Brantle summoned forth his highest ranks from Finalian academic and defensive branches to his rotating clock throne in the sky. A small private audience. The mechanical talk of the floor gears brought a slight ease to a tense room. Thank you, all. I am sure General Anka Steele would be pleased to see so many were eager to show support. It will be extremely difficult to find leadership of that caliber once again, with less than a month remaining before the stage is set for our final battle. The king, our king, had always felt Finalia deserved better. Very seldom does the king settle. Very seldom does he accept defeat. Bratley is a burly man who takes full advantage of the royal barber. A perfectly groomed beard and swept back hair to match complimented the finale and royal crown pearls in ways that would make his own ancestors blush in jealousy. And Castile was a good man. He led Finalia to many victories. It's a shame he was taken from hmm. her. Yes, uh, it's truly heartbreaking, sire. Avela Torsion. Captain Avela Torsion. Leader of the Finalian Royal Guard and the King's most trusted combatant. Aside from the obvious, whose casket was just wheeled down to be lowered somewhere near the Royal Tomb. Evie, as she's known amongst her ranks, has never let the King down. Well, neither had Anka Steel, except for that one time. Very seldom does the King settle, but he may have to this once. The General was someone I would have gladly laid my life down for had I been sent to battle by his side. Will this self-flattery be a theme tonight? If I may, why have you summoned us here after the funeral of our late general, my king? Dr. Lennox, Captain Toshon. My liege, 
As you may know, the Stalin nation was no doubt successful in rendering Ankostil's battalion defenseless in the southern Andean and Tertios. The late general is no longer with us, but we cannot dismiss his loss as our final stand. Representatives of the Stalin High Council have proposed a final encounter, a valiant attempt to end this rapacious squabble once and for all. In one month's time, the best of both nations will meet head on, face to face. Not a blade, fist, or shell within our walls will be spared. And the last remaining soldier will return full proprietorship of the final Lunianite deposit back to their own nation and to their king. Thirty days to prepare and see our great nation at last ascend as true leaders. The rightful heirs of all, Mondrea. Glory to Mondrea. Glory to Finalia. <clears throat> <clears throat> I have seen the full extent of our enemy, King Brontley. Mm. We need only half that. She just confessed to so not best being best in the same best battle best that claimed on Castile's life. Best I honestly can't tell if she just said that to sway the king's best oncoming best decision. The grand king of all, Mondrea. The Zhrok will be ours, this I promise you. She's trying a bit too hard to win him over. But our people have grown weary of this war for Moonlit Rock. Whether this is the final deposit within the planet's crust or not, the general consensus is clear. Our weary Mondrian people would rather know when the end was near, utilizing their final days to the fullest extent, instead of squeezing by on more of that last remaining natural resource the people call Zrok more properly known as Lunaeanite. A few years ago, our nation Finalia had developed an intricate new Zerok detecting device, which brought us back into the mining industry. But the ever-busy tunnelers of the opposing Stelan nation had never stopped, with the last four out of five healthy Zerok veins being under their claim and within their land. The final fifth vein met them just inside our own borders, being the largest underground vein of Zrok ever discovered in the 1,000-some years of recorded Mondrian history. Needless to say, a bunch of dirty, exhausted miners who haven't seen daylight for weeks are not the best negotiators. Some very proud, very relentless workers fought for full claim to the resource. Others believed the vast network of tunnels Stelan had already built gave them full right to this vein, whilst Finalian miners all fought for their own right to claim as it laid closer to their homes. And now our two Mondrian peoples are in a bloody duel for the last remaining fuels that would extend Mondrian life for at least one more century, leaving the defeated to beg the victor for some kind of trade agreement lest they try to survive an aging planet on the brink. The end is nigh, is one way to put it. So you believe we can lead Finalia's forces in the General's wake, rest his soul, for some kind of end-all battle to stake full claim in the final Lunaeanite deposit? I believe one of you can. I wish you would make this decision easier on me. My king, the solution is clear. Call me forth, and me alone. I will become the general of the Finalian forces and lead your nation to the final and only victory it needs to claim your rightful spot as Mondrea's supreme ruler. Uh, yes, that. Uh, wait, a moment, if you please. Why can't we just work together as co-commanders of the Guard? Evie just stares at me for a few awkward seconds as her head slowly turns back to our leader. This is exactly why you should have called this meeting for me, and only me, tonight. As the sole general of Finalia, I will guarantee your success and your throne. I truly, sincerely appreciate your tenacity. Finalian hierarchy code decrees, should the Grand Finalian General become casualty of war, the ruling master Generalis Royalis, the king, must select a successor from the highest ranks of not only the military, but also the mercantile and academic sect. Unfortunately, our current mercantile general is... Uh, a, complete a complete idiot. idiot. Ah, well. Now, both of you retain crucial skills for our success in the bout against Stalin. 
Alas, I can only place my undivided trust on a single entity. One, who will watch my every move and check it with magnified scrutiny as we carry this city through dreadful night to triumphant dawn. Understood. Then look no further, Fenelian King. If anything, I'd at least be impressed with how adamant she is to make her point. Gotta hand it to her. She's dead set on taking this position. Looking back, maybe she was the best choice. As captain of the Fenalian Royal Guard, she's seen over 101 battlefield triumphs. Her skills with the blade are sharp enough to keep any Sky Pirate's arms holstered behind inhibition. She's only ever experienced one defeat in a sparring duel with Castile. Perhaps that's how he got the job. Should the king pit her and I in a duel of our own? I'd prefer she take that one more win, and I'd have returned to my studies. <laughs> Vela Torshon, captain of the Fenalian Royal Guard. You have my trust in the fight. You prove yourself in delivering dominant victories for our fair city. The battle itself would no doubt be won under your hand. You live by the bullet, by the blade, but... Brute force can only take so much. Donovan Lennox, chief historian, tactician, you have my trust in strategy. The agenda before, during, and after battle would be well lit under your hand. To this day, your cunning guy subverts much potential loss. But I must ask, where is your thirst for blood? One of you will be given full right to reclaim the broken, and only one of you shall claim my full trust in redeeming Finalia and turning this war. And you shall walk at my side in this new age, the long-awaited, unified Mondrea. I will announce my decision in the morning. At which time? Excuse my insolence, my liege, but every passing moment is critical. Should you appoint me this very second, I would gather the troops for training, not but a second later. <clears throat> you are excused, Captain. You are both excused. Please, leave me to my thoughts. And that was it. Our company with the King was dismissed. I have to applaud Avela. She's headstrong as a general should be, as a Fenalian general should be. She was certainly assertive enough to meet with me to serve her own opinion a la carte a bit later, in an alleyway just beyond the castle grounds. The walk alongside her to the throne room doors was awkward enough. Thankfully, interrupted, as she was nearly 20 steps ahead before a royal attendant took me aside. <clears throat> Sir Lennox, a word. Uh, why, why, yes, what is it? King Brantley requests an aside. If you'll follow me to his chambers, please. But of course, lead the way. It wasn't far. The royal chamber's exact location was kept from citizen knowledge. Imagine my surprise when I found out it was just a door before the throne room. With the captain rounding the tower just out of sight, the attendant opened the double doors leading to King Brantley's private rooms. It was a lot plainer than I would have expected. Typical rooms throughout the citadel are adorned with gold-crusted cogs and stainless walls, no exposed pipe. But these rooms, other than a few pieces of furniture lined with royal crests and jewels, the king's rooms were very... normal. The ceiling above was possibly the most interesting thing about this floor, as the exposed machinery that led to the clockwork throne above was tick-tocking along, its rhythm almost alleviating to any mind burdened by the responsibility of leading the most powerful nation. To my surprise, the king was already here, exiting what appeared to be his bedroom just beyond the foyer. My king, I must assume you've already had a private accord with Ms. Torsion as well? <laughs> he thinks you highly of your king, Donovan. Miss Page, if you would. Sire, sir. Uh, may I ask why I had you stay behind? Mm. I wish this was easier. My lord? The captain is not a new general. Uh, surely you don't imply I'm, I'm not worthy of such prestige either. Uh, not yet. Both of you shan't grasp such holy laurel. Permission to speak freely, 
But why? Why would you even hold an audience with us to tell us of the position? Could either of you squarely handle leading our troops into a campaign of this scale? <sighs> hmm? She's much too confident in you. Well, <laughs> you're weak, Lennox. And the two of you, together, I feel more confident handing the crown pearl to Stalon. Uh, permission to... Why the theatrics, sire? You ought to know. You've spent much of your life digging through countless layers of Mondrian history. Lost Mondrian history. Buried beneath it all. You must see there is another layer to victory. Another verse, a Fenalian song, yet to be sung. Uh, you've kept up on my research. I never miss a report. I'm, you actually read my work. I'm flattered. Oh, don't be. It's leagues more compelling than the sporadic, feeble fiction and bloody headlines sent here every week. The latest regarding Uncle Steele's upset is why you are here. Do you know what they said of his last words? I believe I've seen a few articles. A simple outmanned, outgunned fight. Nothing else to know. Rubbish. The lot of it. Logistics? Simply half the story. Truth be told, Mon Castile spent weeks at his stake near the Lunia Nightbane. Weeks? Without proper gear, exposure to the rock would make any normal mine worker go... Insane. <sighs> yes. Surely they were prepared. They were extravagantly prepared for a fight above ground. But Stalin tactics have gotten a bit craftier as of late. I can't believe that. They lured the fight into the mines. As you know, the Stalin nation has acquiesced four out of the five remaining known veins of our planet's precious lifeblood. And their gear was far better to endure a fight below ground. Several of our men, clad in old Fenalian mining gear, led the fight. Once they spotted a Stalin combatant, they gave chase, striking down small enemy squadrons. It's like a child's game of connect the dots. Before long, our men were surrounded by Earth. Once they approached the uncovered Lunia night, they found it unguarded. Falsified intel led them to believe Stalin had abandoned the fight and surrendered the vein. Uh, victory by mowing down a few squads? This is becoming more and more obvious. The smaller Stalin squadrons were decoys plotting a path through the mines. Too good to be true. Your hindsight is quite sharp, Doctor. Had you not been away on assignment in the Northwest... I'd have had you down there with him. And I'd have gladly attended and assisted in any way possible, my liege. Mm. Yes, I know. It seems the general's instincts were wary of a trap as well. They managed to set up camp where they believed was safe, to monitor the vein from afar. But every patrol and sentinel slowly lost their hold on reality, going mad before being slain by Stalin guerrilla operatives hidden just beyond the line of sight. <sighs> they were too close. Even with the new detecting device, they believed themselves to be out of range. Over 80 feet away. Uh, 80? The paralyzing mental effects of overexposure to the moonlit rock is only considered lethal at half of that. So we thought. Every one of our valiant soldiers was struck down in an inebriate haze. Hysteria. This could be the most potent deposit yet. Making our troops lose it at such distance. But may I ask, how did we retrieve the general's body? The coffin empty. <laughs> the truth about Anka Steel. About all of that down there. The ardent king spoke light against this thick, suffocating, and dim room. He was still alive. <laughs> for a time. What? The eve prior to the announcement of our defeat at the border, he was here, exactly where you stand now, in this vestibule, but keeled over in fits of rage and discomfiture. I caught myself relieving my staggered stance. I heard the split of bone as I left my bedchamber. His knees must have shattered as he collapsed before me, arms outstretched, clawing for moonlight. As I called out for the guards, not but a few simple words echoed through his blistered, bloody lips. And in a blinding crack of light, he was gone. 
My, my king, may I ask the words, his final words, what were they? You are listening to Andrea Memories. I need a whiskey, hollow point ammo, and someone to just try. A new sci-fi comic thriller, retro in style, modern in feel. A Quentin Tarantino film in space for fans of alien and 80s sci-fi horror. Violent and brash, no holds barred, neon explosion fest through time. I've been out in space for a decade. No telling how far we've gone. Does it matter? Follow Hannah, a young girl, an unwilling test subject to government experiments. Traveling through the cosmos with her guardian, the Red Angel. A dark force leads her to confront a troubled, perilous past. Doesn't matter why they're in distress. It's a distress signal. We're going. We all have terrifying demons. Dark Heaven Girl harnesses a terror of her own to face down those monstrosities, physical and mental, to bring out the light within. Issue 1, available on Indiegogo.com. Backers of this new comic series will receive a limited-run variant cover by Jet Falco. Dark Heaven Girl by Drayton W. Jones. A guardian to one may be a devil to another. This... Mondrea memories. What the hell is taking so long? He trip over his books or something? Hey, Lennox. Miss Torsion, Captain Torsion, had been waiting for me just past the royal grounds. The speed at which she was approaching was akin to charging the opposition. What do you know? Vela. Excuse me? I found her hand, her strong hand, like a captain's blade, diagonally across from her tilted side, laid out against the soft tendon between my chest and left shoulder. Sharp, swift, Evie. You do know something. Well, of course. I've been piecing together Mondrian history for most of my no, life. something else. Ugh, you've got an in with King Brantley, haven't you? I should have expected you men in your secrets. I can assure you, Evie... There's nothing I know that I haven't already logged away within the royal records. I was surprised she let me push away her arm bone from my joints so easily. If I found something else, you'd know it. That is, unless you haven't been keeping up with the reports. I've been busy. She claims as she unsheathes about a sixth of her blade from her hip, simply to adjust the seat in its hilt, I hope. I'm still surprised the king is funding you and your history scams. With all the resources needed to ensure proper victory for our city. I still have my say in the war room. And your say can only get you so far. Eventually, you're going to have to toss the books down and put up a fist or two. Such is war, I suppose. I gave her a polite shrug and watched her seat the gleam of her menacing blade back where it belongs. I will have this position. And if he decides to go with some bumbling book boy busybody like you with your conniving little secretary, I will rally all of Finalia behind me. My action and influence alone will prove your place in this palace is broken. Await the king's final word. And my appointment. If my vote could count. I doubt she heard my confidence in her and her skill. It's textbook Finalia. Strong, unwavering, threatening. I suppose a bustling city of traders, merchants, and constant sky traffic fits a woman of such prowess. Needs a woman of such unrelenting vigor. Someone who could truly lead Finalia's armies to victory. If only she had heard what I had heard. If only she had seen what I was about to see. I spent the next few minutes a free man. As free as a man with the knowledge of the end of the world could be free. I met the local bookseller for some fresh paper and a fountain pen. I stopped at the market for my usual half loaf of fire crusted sky oat bread, a Flintworth cactus apple, and a small bottle of Weaver's Mead. I passed the usual coin, left the usual tip. I often debate myself on whether it's more satisfying to partake in this precious Vinalian artisan cuisine. Or if it's more satisfying to see the merchants smile when they receive royal coin. Being in service of the king, I've always received healthy payroll. 
It's only my right and duty to ensure the fine craftspeople of our fair city receive their share. I find repeated patronage only enhances the quality of such luxury. <sighs> I must admit, though, I do miss that warm, sweet bread. If only it had tasted the same today. Nearly there, one final stop to drop off a piece for the homeless elderly man on my corner. As I said, these were my minutes. My minutes. Free. For the artifact and endeavor that was about to consume my every waking and sleeping second would have full reign over me and my mind. It started with a package. I saw it waiting at my top doorstep, barely leaning against the wooden door. A chest marked with the king's seal. Had this been a royal parcel, I'd approach with enthusiasm. But this was older, worn, decrepit. Finalian mail service policy is to inspect and nearly always throw out such old capsules for threats of international terrorism and the like. It couldn't be from the king. Could he have tied what he knew of my historical research to the general's fate? Second fate, rather. And had he made his decision that quickly? Could it be a threat left by the captain? Perhaps a violent and dirty fate of my own lies within. Is she that desperate to rid herself of the competition? Ghast! Such a revolting cocoon. As I passed the lamp lighting my dark alley, I started to notice. The box was sealed within a thin red film. Nay, a slime. I could not bring myself to dirty my hands now, not before my last meal. I remembered my dark leather gloves in my coat pocket, and I slipped them on carefully as not to release my fresh grocery. But as I was slipping on the left and carefully gripping the bag of food with my teeth, the mead bottle had eagerly slipped out from under my arm. I was quick enough to catch it with my already gloved right hand, but unfortunately, the angle proved too extreme for the weight of the contents in the paper bag, which slightly tore from my mouth. I was lucky to cash most of my supplies. However, it was as if I could hear the cactus apple's victorious cry for freedom as it hopped down each doorstep and rolled out of sight. Another snack for the homeless. Maybe some lucky mutt. I shrugged it off and carefully lifted the parcel from its lean on the door. No surprise, the red slime left its mark there, too. Not to mention more than half the doorstep will need a mop after this mess. Getting situated for my meal, I removed my old gloves with care not to touch that red mess and tossed them in the nearest waste bin. No need to wash what's been so defiled. Had I known then what I know now, I would have quarantined every drop of that red sloppy film to better understand its composition in hopes of linking to its origins. But I was in a hurry to eat, and I was younger. Not by much, but a month's time can leave its effects on a man. After quickly downing enough bread and meat to tide me over and fuel a curious mind, I approached the wooden chest, which I placed at the center of my work desk atop the loft above my study. Piles of books like Pillars of Progress lined the winding metal steps up to my academic hermit's paradise. With it donned the full barrens of man-made Illumini. I took mental pictures of the thing, how the red covering seemed to reflect, bend, and absorb light simultaneously. Of course, the one question that burns through the mind of any recipient what is inside? And believe me, I wanted it opened as soon as humanly possible. But this night had left a spirit of caution haunting my every motion. Whoever wished me to have it definitely wanted it opened, in my presence, and as ceremonious and momentous as possible. I was already two-thirds through that glaring red mask, and after every pull and tug at the protective goo that encapsulated the enigma within, I heard a chorus shrill high in my mind, a long trumpets of triumph. A ceremonious, momentous, unforgettable unboxing indeed. It must have taken an hour to remove all that hardening slime to allow full access. Not only did it turn into a crusty protective shell after every palmy touch, but after an hour of excruciating work, its collective mass at the foot of my desk could swallow a small house pet whole. Good, I thought. It's much easier to remove after it hardens. But why? Why did it harden? What is this material, anyway? 
I may have thought my first guess of alien space slime to be slightly immature, but I may have not been that far off. Even more bizarre, the chipped off shell seemed to slowly vanish into thin air, maybe as if to rapidly evaporate back into the star fields above. But all my curiosity was focused on opening this time capsule of the heavens. Roughly 16 inches wide, 8 inches back, and 4 inches deep, it would be perfect to house the ceremonial royal dagger, or even a commemorative barrelman's spyglass. Or maybe the contents inside are just as enigmatic as the muck that once kept it apart from our world. Only one way to know. I took a deep breath, eyes wider than a child in a sweet shop, and I released the front latch. As soon as it was clear, the entire topside flung open, revealing a rusty spring-operated mechanism for quick release and use of what was inside. Whoever owned this chest previously must have needed it opened promptly many, many times. It was then I noticed a blazing cyan glow engrossing the room. I wish to say it was almost magical, but the thousands of scientific questions and possibilities that engulfed my mind quickly washed over. I felt it swell and bend the walls. It warmed me. I heard it call to me, and it hurt. It hurt to know this was here. In the middle of the box upon a bed of purple silk lay a shard, dark in its deepest core but bright and blue in the coal-like rock that made up its semi-transparent body. It was jagged and flat, perhaps broken on one end, and the other end was pointed, sharp, long, and deadly. It was a weapon at one point. At least that's where my imagination led me at that moment. I had only read and researched about possible ancient technology-based weaponry. Never before had I seen something like this up close. But before I allowed my mind to make such bewildering conclusions, I needed to consider the real. I had only ever seen the precious, shiny, moonlit rock this close a few times, as it is considered scarcer than the most precious metals and gems of the Earth. But never before has it glowed with such majesty. Perhaps a miner at the border removed this from a Lunaeanite stalactite and had it sent as a goodwill gesture. A good luck charm before the war. Or perhaps to frame me for possession of contraband. Damnable at the highest trees and on both sides. A splitting squawk from my desk chair jolted me forth. I nearly fell into it, impaling myself before I could give it proper study. Instead, I sat upright, fully alert, and awaited for the royal guard to storm in and arrest me for possession of such a miracle. But no one came. I thought for sure Evie had already set plans in motion to frame me and gain her seat to the king's right hand. Maybe I give her too much credit. Whoever left this at my door may not have such malicious intent. I must have sat and stared at it for hours. Moonlight reflecting through my balcony window to the surface of this item was the only thing illuminating this retired old bookshop. My lamp's bulb sheltered out the second the box was open. I could have stepped away, trudged up the old winding stair to the top floor personal quarters and ended the night. It would have been so easy. I could have passed out right there even, on that rickety old wooden chair. I swallowed enough of that honey mead. I could have closed my eyes anywhere and drifted off to the calm nothingness we are all so used to. But I stayed. And I stared. It must have been midnight before I even considered picking it up, touching it, examining it further, theorizing it. It's an explosion. This so close. Impossible. We swore thirty days of peace, a surprise attack a day after the final battle declaration. Before I could further catch my breath, I was outside. The door slammed behind me and then vanished as if the knob in my hand didn't even exist. I looked back and my entire building was gone. The repurposed old bookshop, the thousands of worthless books inside, and the comfort of my bed. All gone. I turned back to find my alleyway. Gone. The lamp at my corner. Gone. The weathered homeless man at his breadcrumbs. 
even the cactus root bounce out of frame once more before being swallowed up by blackness. This was it. The nothingness. I must have fallen asleep at my desk in that chair. But no. Why do I feel this? Why am I conscious? Alert. And knowing. I... This isn't right. If I was asleep, I would be at rest. I wouldn't even be having these thoughts, these words, these... I'm reciting these words. How? It wasn't the darkness that alerted me. The sleep of Mondrea has always been darkness. That is what we know. We work tirelessly through our days, we sleep soundly at night, then we awaken the next morn to repeat the cycle. For just over a millennium of history, that is what we know. Then... then why... why am I... here? Here. The ground. A graying, rocky, blue sand. The air. Stale, yet pure. Hard. Hard to breathe. <coughs> Calm yourself. The coughing subsides. I'm, I must be awake. There is unpure sorcery at work here. I've been pulled. I've been pulled into another realm. The very moment I found my footing, I was pushed back. A purely illuminating scream of harrowing, unspoken, ancient ire forced its way through my very being. It was hers. It is done. It came from her. Damned to a hell. Of your own demise, you wretched... The next few seconds happened in a blurry flash of slowed motion. Countless hours of suffering, being twisted, reformed, and contorted in and out of shape. Condensed into a few short seconds of pure terror. My body was no longer my own. It belonged to her. It belonged to chaos. Yet these pains felt all too real. Had Avela hired some dark mage to chant me out of this plane? Remove me entirely from existence? Whatever incantation she addressed to pull and tear away at my soul would be overkill at this point. I was no longer a man, but a spirit. Abandoning the lifeless shell that was my body as I writhed and I tried to scream tried to gasp for air, but my lungs would no longer inflate. They were back in that crumbling husk. And then, all at once, every moment I've ever seen and experienced, every second I've earned of life appeared, and then vanished as I tried to grasp at them. I saw it. I saw the impossible. The unbelievable. An age of beauty, an age of tyranny, an age of sacrifice. And all at once these errors blend into one as I was thrown from the stars above into a death-defying dive deep into the canyon below. This area, this area was the one place I could barely recognize, but soon it too faded. I should have realized then. None of these moments are my own. This body, that spirit, was not my own. These memories, this battle, this pain, and yes, this place, none of it is mine. And through the explosion of past to present, through being torn apart to the seams and rebound as a tome of ancient scrap, I heard her goddess-like voice once more, though shaken and frail. You do not own these people. Their hopes, their 
loves their dream. You shall be shattered. Be gone. The sound, her voice, that pain in this place, all of it sealed away in a split second as if slammed into a large, heavy book. And for what felt like aeons, I was trapped in a dark and cold space. There was no light. There was no life. I was left alone in solitude with what few thoughts I could scrounge, barely able to formulate a single legible word in my mind, bound in nothingness. <sighs> this I know. We know it well. <laughs> this, the absence of dream. Nextus, The Search for the Ocean Shard is a science fiction adventure graphic novel over 1,200 pages in the making. And you want me to get all chummy with some weird mechanoid you found? Follow a band of treasure hunters as they seek an object of monumental power, the fabled Ocean Shard. Though many consider the shard itself to be a tall tale, there certainly are a lot of forces trying to keep our heroes from finding it. Just talk to him, you'll see. Over 40 chapters are free to read online, with weekly updates since 2006. The journey continues at nextdeuce.com. N-E-X-T-U-U-S dot com. Podcast creators should only partner with products they believe in. That's why I'd like to share my good friends woodworking at dwarvenworkshop.net. Andy Goodman is a living woodsmith straight out of mythic legend, dedicated to providing you with one-of-a-kind wood decor, art frames, furniture, tabletop gaming supply, and even kitchen and cosmetic items never elsewhere seen, like his handmade beard combs and soap dishes. His custom orders are absolutely mythical legend. When comic creator Jet Falco's keyboard tray broke in half after a comic drawing marathon, Andy stepped up and made him a custom artist dream setup, complete with live edge, stylus tray, mouse pad, and even the Dreamers Echo logo inscribed upon it. There's a picture of it in the guest art section of dreamersecho.com. He's always willing to turn your imaginative idea into lifelong tangible wooden creation. To make game night classy, check out his custom burned dice towers, magnetic deck boxes, and bottle openers, as well as his impressive phone speaker amplifiers to add some bass to your next booming D&D sesh. <laughs> you gotta see this stuff to believe it. Order the perfect gift for yourself or a friend at dwarvenworkshop.net. That's dwarvenworkshop.net. And tell Andy Jet sent you. This is Mondrea Memories. I'm... I'm awake. I'm still at my desk. My eyes are as wide and open as they've ever been. Dust and pollen of the night left my tear ducts swollen at the ends. I looked down. There sat the shard, the blue still gleaming in the moonlight, the sharp tip lodged deep within my chest. That battle with the witch, the out-of-body prison, that pain, none of that was mine. This, this pain, this was mine. All I, mine. I'm, a, I'm outside. How deep had I gotten? How far had it taken me? I try and try and I try and try and I can never fully remember. The supposed devastating defeat at the hands of some unknown spellcaster? 
the everlasting damnation to silent end, and the shard piercing my heart and ending my own life. I remember that much, but for all that is worthy, I still cannot remember how I got here. I was standing at my balcony, mere steps away from the doors to my loft and the sleeping quarters high above the bookshop. Here, I could see nearly all of northern Mondrea, the lifeless towering mountains to the north. The crust and cliffs to the east lift us high above the thrashing sea, my right. The crumbling desert wastes away to my left, the west. There are no ship routes in my secluded corner of this mecca of dust and salt and smog. The skies are clear of trade for much of the day and absolutely empty at night. Not a single obstacle to hinder this panoramic dread. Every star, sun, and distant pulsar would be our audience. And yes, even that wretched silver moon. And here I was, standing with my bare toes at the edge, a single wood rail at my waist, keeping me from the brink. My left arm stretched out, holding that sharp piece of ancient glowing rock over the edge. I was no longer in physical pain. There was no gaping hole in my chest where the shard had cleft out my life force. No, I felt reborn, remade, awakened. And yet that naked moon gleamed strong off the shard and shone directly into my right eye, bringing more pain. But this pain was my own. Like a magnifying glass, it woke my spirit exponentially so that I may see the spectral evolution this shard displayed as the silvery moonlight pierced its very core. But this was no transformation. It was an unmasking, a daring jeopardization to reveal to me its true colors. I could only stare through the scratching dust on my pupil as its brilliant bright blue peeled away to broadcast a scarlet blood-like red I could only describe as nightmarish, and to fix my unblinking, unaffected gaze on this tool of hatred. It was a simple hurt, to remind me I am no longer in that nightmare, but it was a good hurt. I needed this hurt. For I had rediscovered what was so long forgotten. Humankind's lost key to the gods. The dream. It had come to me that night. This shard had brought it in full force. The mere sight of it begs me to question my every breath. <sighs> this is not real. I will destroy you. I... I need to destroy you. This is not real. Words of such doubt left a pause on my lips, as if I should wait for some otherworldly ghastly being to come tear me out of existence, as it all caved in on itself in a cloud of dust and ash. I could just end it. All of it. For all of us. The deep sleep we all get. It's waiting for me at the tip of this old stone dagger. Yeah, uh, no, it's... it's too much. Too much. My search to uncover the dream may have ended with this weapon, but my possession of it is bringing about many new questions. Questions I know you can answer. I remember I dangled that shard over the edge, threatening to drop it into the sea. Its gaze threatened to take me down with it. It burned hot and frostbit my fingertips and reminded me I was no longer wearing those gloves. I could feel that much now. Very well. I know what I must do. This is no weapon. No tool to reforge what was lost. No scepter to usher in a new age of dream. <laughs> it is a key. And you have shown me the door. I will find the life I relived through that forsaken nightmare. I will reopen what was sealed. I will have my answer. And I will find you in Dead Ark. 
For much of my waking life, I was dedicated to discovering my world's lost histories. Thousands of years of our ancient people were lost in the Great Fade when a blinding shadow washed over us and replaced our dreams with the empty, silent nothing. That is what we know. I studied all which was available to us in the present day. Every graduated class and years of apprenticeship proved tonight to be wasted at both the Stalon and Finalian Academies. I was one of the few remaining in our world who saw the void left by our ancient mothers and fathers and wished to find that one missing piece. I should have known that all those years would be for naught. Time lost. Time, you weren't even mine in the first place. I see that now. The very key to unlocking the limitless powers of this lost ancient dream would simply be gifted to me. And with this, the fire is rekindled. At last, I will find the missing piece. <sighs> Thinking back, it is quite relieving to know I was a bit more robotic, then. I remember the words the Messenger King passed on to me as the late General and Castile erupted into a chaotic bang. The dream will come. The dream will come. He will end. He will end. He will end. It is truly quite unfortunate. Neither King Brantley, his core demographic, nor I, his only syndicated fan, will ever truly know the entirety of his closing statement to end his time in our court. But the notion is clear. As prophetic as the Red Moon crest every 100 years, the dream will return to the people. Do not fear. I will bring a new dawn to our dying planet, and with its slumber, a new awakening, a new breath, a clear mind, free to embrace the infinite blessing of our ancient forebearers. We will end this war. My name is Donovan Lennox, and I will return the dream back to our Donovan Lennox. Lennox! Oh, oh, damn. This is absurd. He has it. Come on, it's just a book. Why the hell should we be so afraid of this thing? It is a prison. A tomb imploring its own exhuming. An exoneration of the death of all dream. But, but Mondrea has been practically without dreams for ages. How would Lennox, citing some old rhymes, bring about what's already been the norm for thousands of remaining citizens? The machine is in motion. The rebirth of the tyrant phantasm, only known now by that pestilent ancient name. The book's upheaval bolsters the eradication of our energi, and without it, we are lost. This place is lost. We would fade into the breach, captive to the Chaos Realm. This true end of dream makes way for the inundation of cascading, torrential...
Andrea Memories, the Dreamer's Echo Podcast. Keep listening for a special message from the creator of the show, as well as a bonus memory. For a full cast and crew list, please visit dreamersecho.com slash podcast. Stay awake. Hi, I'm Jet Falco. I'm the creator of Dreamers Echo and Mondrea Memories. First of all, thank you so much for discovering and listening to the show. Seriously, pour yourself another coffee, uh, eat another snack. Come on, you've earned it. As for me, I could not be more excited. Not only is this my first big audio production, but Mondrea Memories will serve as one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle that is Dreamers Echo. I started Dreamers Echo as a thrilling adventure comic to build the main foundation of the story you're hearing now, and it's one of the only comics in the world that has a fully original read-along soundtrack. So not only do you have an epic visual adventure, but every comic has an immersive song to elevate your reading experience. In fact, some of the music you hear featured in this show comes from the book. To dive deeper into this expanding universe, visit DreamersEcho.com and order some of the sound comic adventures. As of now, two volumes of comic and music are available for purchase on our store page. So yeah, go ahead and get some of those shiny autograph books on your shelf. This podcast, Mondrea Memories, will bring Dreamers Echo to new depths. Now you see why I'm so excited. Where the comic continues to evolve with every new chapter and song, this podcast aims to add an entirely new layer to the story. Every season is a self-contained story arc, so you can fully enjoy the show even if you don't read the comic, although I must inform you that the entire tale is best enjoyed alongside the book and music. As the story grows, you'll start to see more threads connecting in all sorts of ways. Oh, and one more thing, real quick. The biggest and best part of it all is that you get to be a part of it. Outside of my lovely voice talent guests, I do nearly 100% of the work, and it's quite a challenge to create an epic sound adventure as it is to find amazing supportive people out there who will keep the lights on. Please consider visiting our Patreon page to keep the show going strong. It can only stay alive with your help. As a supporter of the show, you'll gain access to amazing rewards. The comics, music, behind-the-scenes content, shirts, posters, art prints, button stickers, postcards, trading cards, and so much more. It all starts at DreamersEcho.com. Look for our Patreon link in the middle of the page. You can't miss it. And thank you so very much for keeping the dream alive. And don't forget to share this show and write a review. Hashtag Mondrea Memories or hashtag Dreamers Echo. Your voice counts in the growth of this show, so keep your friends and family in the loop. And if you want to follow along and point and laugh as I do all this hard work, you can find me on my social medias at DreamersEcho.com. As a listener, you've been chosen to join the memory watchers to witness these visions blend chaos into reality. May the memories of the Mondrian people no longer be captive to the chaotic flow of the long-lost dream. And since you stuck around for all of this, here's a little bonus memory for you. Enjoy. You wanted to see us, Captain? Ah, yes. Lieutenant Boris and Levi. Shut the door behind you, please. This door? Of course, that door. What other door did we come through, you dolt? I dolt? Oh, you mean bolt. I bolt. <laughs> I bolt. Right, that'll do. Listen to me, Lieutenant. The following conversation is off the record, untranscripted and non-existent from all documents, official, royal, or otherwise. It never happened. Understood? Crystal. Clear, Captain. Following the death of General N. Castile, King Brantley has informed me his decision for his replacement is down to two main candidates. <laughs> Oh, you think we're good enough to replace the general? Oh, the late general, rest his soul. I was at his funeral, you know. Such a beautiful service. I'd never before seen that many kite blossom petals released at once. How the hell did they do that? Ah, of course, they were probably synthetic, right? Like the trees in Lufe. Yeah, yeah, they've got to be. Anyway, how will the final decision be made for the new general? A fight to the death or something? I don't think I could bring myself to kill Levi. He's like my best friend. Boris, are you finished? <clears throat> As I was saying, the king has it down to me. And Donovan Lennox. What? 
Lennox, what has he accomplished? He's the dolt, right? Did I use that word right? <sighs> I'll admit, Lennox's military and tactical training is quite thorough. I suspect the king will take full advantage of his knowledge of Stalon's method. Before his residency in Finalia, he graduated second in his class with honors at Stalon. But I thought we weren't allowed to cross into Stalon territory for school. It was before wartime, Boris. Lennox is older than us. Really? How much older? Much older. Not too much, right? So I'd still have a chance to be general. No age requirement. I think he's actually Evie's age. Ooh. Captain will do, gentlemen. We may be off the record, but I still expect you both to act professional. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, Captain. A- apologies, Captain Torsion. Stay focused, Leave. I swear I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> Even with all of his previous training, it doesn't make sense. He doesn't have nearly enough field experience. There are at least 20 more qualified people who have training at both academies. I have trained at both as well. And I have over a decade abroad. Donovan's only been a tactician for two battles, and need I remind you, one of them led to N. Castile's ultimate. It's so painstakingly obvious that Lennox knows something, and the king needs it at the war table. I mean, he was second in his class at Stalan. What a loser. Who was first? King should hire that guy. Impossible. It was the Admiral Wolfjord of the Stalan Naval Guard. Eh, bummer. Well, second's better than third, am I right? Captain Avela was third. Oh, crap. I... 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 Maybe it has something to do with his... other job? Lennox has been the self-appointed Chief Historia Royalis Mondrenica since the first day out of school. Then a few years after that, the king took notice of his work and brought him in for the top cabinet of the academic branch. He used to have a whole team of historians working under him before the war. <sighs> maybe they... Ugh. Maybe he found something. And that's where we come in. I need you to follow him. Copyright 2020. DreamersEcho.com Creative Commons Attribution License Non-Commercial No Derivatives.